before you invest. Investigate. All investors should study the facts carefully before they buy any stock. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Decrypting Crypto Podcast, a CastBox original show. I'm Matthew Housebarby, and yet again, I'm joined with my co-host, Austin Knight. Hey, Matt, and hello to everyone listening. So last week, we did our first project deep dive, which was good fun. Uh, we dissected the the Sire project, which is a decentralized cloud platform. Since then, we've had a bunch of questions about the project, and I highly recommend that you check out the show notes for that episode. And if you actually haven't listened to that episode yet, go back and listen to it. Really cool, if we don't say so ourselves, um, like <laughs> breakdown of what the project's all about. But within the show notes, we've added a ton of like interesting articles, follow-up resources around all the different stuff related to the SIA project. Yeah, that was a good time. And uh, we're definitely looking forward to doing more project deep dives like that in the future. We could tell that people really got a kick out of that one. So if you've seen a project that you'd like us to cover on the podcast, let us know. You can either email us at podcast at thecoinoffering.com or you can just tweet us at the coin offering. That's right. But today... We're not going to go and do another project deep dive. Uh, we are going to do more of those in the future, but we're going to park those for now. Instead, we'll be having another main feature discussion. And this week's episode is going to focus around everybody's favorite topic, ICOs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Before we do that, though, uh, let's chat about a couple stories that have come up recently. Big things are happening. The first one is that Jack Ma, who is the executive chairman of Alibaba, at least as of recording this, but it sounds yeah. like he's <laughs> permanently retiring. And if you're not familiar with Alibaba, that's the Chinese uh, e-commerce giant. It's like the Amazon of China, and it is a force to be reckoned with. Uh, very important. Certainly is. Yeah, yeah. So when Jack Ma speaks, people listen. Uh, and recently, <laughs> he said, blockchain will be useless if it doesn't help the environment. Now, taken a little bit out of context, that, that can sound like more of, of a jab than I think he was intending for it to be. Uh, he was speaking at a conference where he was asked how Alibaba might use blockchain tech in the future. And the way that you could interpret this quote is not necessarily that uh, he was attacking blockchain as much as he was saying, if and when Alibaba uses blockchain tech, it has to be something that is going to take the environment into account. So he was kind of partially putting the onus on them as well. But I think that in the context of the greater blockchain space and community and you know all of these projects that we've been talking about and the mass amount of consumption that this technology has come to be associated with it is interesting to think about this sort of impotence to factor the environment into decisions that are being made and, and projects that are being created yeah and i think we're seeing that a lot more from larger companies like we, we i think last week actually we we talked a bit about like when are some of these big companies that keep talking about blockchain, like Jack Dorsey uh, from Twitter, obviously Zuckerberg, Facebook, like they're consistently talking about blockchain. When are they going to start using it? And I think for bigger companies, there is definitely arguably a greater onus on them to have social responsibility and environmental responsibility to implement these correctly, but also back things that aren't going to kill the planet in the future. Mm -hmm. I, I There's been a ton of articles out as well talking a bit about like these different comparisons. I, it's, it's almost become a bit of a parody uh, now. I read an article <laughs> and it was like, Bitcoin mining isn't anywhere near as environmentally destructive as gold mining. And it's like, what are we, com <laughs> are we comparing the same things here? It's like, I, there is a lot more gold mining that's kind of went on over the years and it's a very different process. Yeah. And I don't know. I think there's like, it's obvious. We've talked about this before. Proof of work based consensus consumes a sh ton of energy. It's arguably not sustainable. 
comparing it to other things. Like I saw another article and it was like, the existing banking industry uses more energy than Bitcoin. It's like, well, Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a banking industry that's been built over more than a hundred years now. And there's a ton of infrastructure properties. That's the problem that those comparisons don't take into account is that part of the expectation that comes with new technology and the adoption of new technology is that it's an improvement on (laughs) (laughs) something that was, you know, the the pre-existing status quo, especially if that status quo was developed a hundred years ago. So, you know, it wouldn't... (laughs) It wouldn't be well received if someone was like, hey, guys, like I have this new alternative energy source that we we can adopt all around the world today. And it's just as environmentally destructive as coal. (laughs) 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 Like, that's not very compelling. (laughs) I I I hear an ICO in the making, though. (laughs) That's what I hear. (laughs) But um, to to bring it back to what we were talking about, the final point, actually, that's worth calling out in what Jack Ma was talking about from Alibaba. So the Next Web covered this in a recent article that they wrote. And one of the things that they actually called out here was like, although Jack Ma has kind of said some arguably negative things about blockchain and distributed ledger technology, which is blockchain is a form of distributed ledger technology. One fun fact here is that Alibaba and IBM actually hold 90%, 90% of all distributed ledger technology related patents worldwide. They have a very firm grip on the patents behind a lot of this distributed ledger technology. Now, to imagine that they're not going to use that would be a crazy thing. I mean, me and you, Austin, we've been talking a lot about IBM and how much they've been doing in the blockchain space. Super interesting stuff. I I think we were talking maybe about uh, trying to get someone from IBM to come on the show and talk a bit more about this, which would be really cool as well. It would be a cool chat because they are applying their enterprise blockchain solution across so many verticals. And they're, they're really doing it. It's, it's amazing. IBM doesn't get huge press or <laughs> even that much respect in, in inner tech circles, which I find very bizarre because the amount of innovation that I am aware of that's happening at that company right now and, and what's coming out of that company on multiple levels is very impressive. E- everything from like like work culture <laughs> to like approach to design and, and fundamental changes to their consultancy to going full in on unproven in many ways technology and finding legitimate applications for it across so many industries. It's very interesting. Make IBM sexy again. That's our <laughs> campaign <laughs> slogan. <laughs> so... Making IBM sexy again to one side, another really, this is a super interesting story that I know both me and you, Austin, have like lost hours just pouring into. And there seems to be new developments within this story, in particular uh, within Reddit every day. And the story here is around an old Bitcoin wallet from several years ago, I think from around 2013, something like that. No, actually, I think even earlier than that, potentially. But this Bitcoin wallet has over $1 billion worth at the current market value. Bear in mind, like the market values went down a significant amount recently of Bitcoin. And after several years of zero activity, all of a sudden, has started becoming very active and has started moving funds around. There's been clearly some of the analysis, which is mind-blowingly interesting, the way that people, just everyday people on Reddit, have been putting together this huge like technical analysis into where all of these funds have been moving to the different Bitcoin addresses, spreading it round. It looks like they're trying to cover their tracks and shift around the the coins into multiple addresses, basically getting rid of a paper trail. Unfortunately, you're on a public blockchain. Uh, There is always (laughs) a paper trail. And we'll share out the Reddit thread in the show notes. But 
there's been a lot of like investigative work around who yeah. this wallet owner actually is, right? Yeah, the analysis is almost more interesting than the conclusions um, yeah. because it is a, a level of almost like crowdsourced analysis that, you know, previously just would not have been possible with closed financial transactions where it's very difficult to, to get this type of information that is now fully transparent uh, and, and public. And it's just so bizarre to, you know, have, have somebody write a thread where they're like, you know, I, I've noticed that this, there's this huge wallet that has had no activity for so many years. And now all of a sudden funds are starting to move around and people are speculating around what that actually means. You've got an individual or, or individuals that are splitting up a ton of Bitcoin and spreading it around, making a number of exchanges on Binance and Bitfinex. And it's all something that you can watch happen in, in real time. Yeah. There's some really interesting theories on who the wallet owner is. <laughs> one of one of them was oh it's a person that that was in prison and and now they're out of prison and they're moving their cash. Another yeah. was uh, <laughs> I feel like that's such a lazy theory. <laughs> it was yeah. a criminal, a criminal that's now active. <laughs> they're all criminals. <laughs> <laughs> Another theory was that it could be a Silk Road user, which mm. we briefly talked about Silk Road in season one, but it was sort of like this very vibrant underground eBay, I guess you could say. <laughs> I guess so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mostly uh, it, it came to be associated as a marketplace to buy illegal goods or hire a hitman. <laughs> On the dark web, right. Yeah, or it could be Dread Pirate Roberts wallet. I don't yeah. I, I don't necessarily yes. know the background to this. So Matt, do you want to... Yeah, Dread Pirate Roberts was like the the OG of Silk Road. And if anyone familiar with the Ross Ulbricht case, where he was deemed the owner of Silk Road and the person behind Dread Pirates Roberts, like Avatar, that was his like moniker or handle, whatever you want to call it, right? And uh, there are arguments against that. I guess we'll probably never truly know who that person is. But a lot of people are saying this is that person's wallet, whether that's Ross Ulbricht or not. Yeah, and then I think another couple of theories there was it was a Mt. Gox cold wallet that had been seized or is still owned by Mt. Gox. So Mt. Gox, we've also talked about this previously, I think it was 24. 14 that Mt. Gox like sh was shut down. It was a huge Bitcoin exchange. Tons of people lost a huge amount of their Bitcoins. But the theory is that a few of the original owners of Mt. Gox, this wallet belongs to one of them. Uh, the final theory is like it's just an early like Bitcoin whale that bought up or stored a ton of Bitcoin early on, and it's and it belongs to that person. Lots of different theories. Honestly, the analysis is just... I, I've, I would say I've lost at minimum three to four hours of, of my life just going through... Or <laughs> I say lost, it's added significant fun and value just going through these Reddit threads. But I would highly encourage doing it. If anything, just like some of the data visualizations that people were able to produce. Yeah, it's very cool. It, uh, it's so cool. Yeah. There's an interesting element to this though, Matt, which we were chatting about before we started recording. And, and that's a, a question of foul play, right? Mm. So if, if there is some form of foul play here and you have unknowingly perhaps ended up with some of the Bitcoins that were being moved around, from this wallet, there, there could be some interesting implications. We're not completely sure because this is somewhat unpaved territory, but say that there is foul play with this wallet and whoever is moving around these funds, they sell them off and then you happen to buy them. The funds, regardless of whether or not you realize that you just bought them from this wallet, it, it is traceable back mm -hmm. to the original wallet. And this raises questions around if if something illegal is happening here and an unknowing party on the other end of this exchange purchases these funds thinking that they're just getting any old Bitcoin, but they happen to get one that can be tied back to this wallet. Are they implicated in that? Yeah. 
And it's interesting because like you may be thinking, well, I wouldn't buy, I wouldn't buy uh, like funds from this wallet. Like that's not the way it works, right? Like what's been shown in this analysis is that the wallet owner has transferred in a lot of these significant amounts of, of Bitcoins into both the Binance and Bitfinex. And I think one other exchange that I can't remember, cryptocurrency exchanges, and they've been making trades. Now, if you were to just go into Binance now and you wanted to just buy some Bitcoins, you go in and buy some, you, you are, you're not buying them necessarily from Binance. You're just trading with another person who's selling anonymously you could unknowingly and loads of people will have as a result of this right mm-hmm. they'll people will be in possession of bitcoins from this wallet now we don't know that there is foul play that's happened here but something that's very interesting to think about as a thought exercise because this isn't just theoretical so we talked a bit about silk road when in 2013 they shut down silk road and ross Ulbricht was sentenced to life in prison they also confiscated all of his bitcoins. He had 144,336 bitcoins. That <laughs> is an unbelievable amount. Well, the US government confiscated them, right, from this wallet. And back in, say, 2016, I believe, they started to then auction these coins off. To the public, this is, just auctioning them off, like they would with a lot of confiscated goods. They often auction stuff like that off. Yeah. And during this time, people were bidding way, way above Bitcoin's like market price for these Bitcoins because the theory here is that these are truly the only kind of quote-unquote clean Bitcoins that have been processed through. Bear in mind, like every single Bitcoin is completely traceable, right? These ones have been passed through the US government and they have been sold off. They have ultimately been completely cleaned or laundered, whatever you want to use as a terminology. <laughs> so they're, they're ultimately the only Bitcoins in circulation that in the eyes of the, at least the US government are yeah. completely legit. And... To your point, Austin, right? If there was a point where you have come into possession of Bitcoins that have had like foul play, that have been deemed illegal in one way, shape or another, would it give the US government the right to take those and confiscate them from you or even implicate you in part of this? I think more the former than the latter, right? But like... Yeah, or at least you would hope. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. And, and well, that's and that's a very good point. Like how it'd be very difficult to even prove that you haven't taken part in laundering like these yeah. these funds so super interesting but kind of scary but also i think it does shed an interesting light on public blockchains and in particular i think this is one of the reasons why a lot of people that are very conscious of this flood to cryptocurrencies like um, Monero, for example, or Zcash, where they are privacy coins, where they use stealth addresses Mm -hmm. so that basically Mm -hmm. you cannot trace this kind of stuff. But I think we should definitely get someone on the show to talk about this. Maybe uh, one of the team from Monero or Zcash, because I know this is like something I've heard them talk a little bit about before. But yeah, yeah, this is like conspiracy theory central right now. (laughs) 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 <laughs> <laughs> but it's just so it's so interesting because it is unknown territory and whenever you're going into unknown potentially illegal territory with government involved yeah it gets a little scary especially when there's pre-existing preference against the technology that you're you're working with i think there's a lot of fear out there from governments as we've discussed in the past around cryptocurrencies and the illicit activities that they can purportedly support and this yeah this would be an interesting sort of foray (laughs) 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 willingly or unwillingly uh into that zone yeah Maybe the plot twist is that it's actually your wallet, Austin, and this is a giant <laughs> ruse to take you off the scent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you caught me. <laughs> so conspiracy theories to one side. Why don't we jump into our main feature? 
Yeah, so today we're going to be taking a retrospective look at how the ICO boom has developed and the projects that have come out of those ICOs. Okay, so today we're going to be talking as part of our main feature all about ICOs. And instead of me and Austin just shitting on ICOs for like 20 minutes, we <laughs> wanted to try and give a bit of a retrospective here in terms of like how ICOs have grown, what the history is almost today, and also some interesting things that have been coming up. And in particular, one really interesting story that came as part of a study that was carried out on trustnodes.com. Anyone that hasn't checked out trustnodes.com, they have a bunch of really cool data on the various aspects of blockchain. You should check it out. We'll add a link in the show notes. But what has been found is that in September 2018, uh, which is when we're recording this episode, there has been a huge spike in ICO projects that are selling off a load of the ETH, like the Ethereum that they've raised. So what I, just to be clear in what I'm saying here, the ICO projects that have already raised a bunch of Ether from the, the ICO fundraising, what is often the case is they use these funds to then obviously build their projects and uh, develop their platforms, etc. Every now and then they'll sell off. It's it's not uncommon for them to sell off a small amount of ETH just to then fund some of their projects. But to give a bit of context, in like in August, ICOs typically were selling between like, and, and this is all ICOs combined, were selling between like 1,000 to 5,000 ETH a day. But in one single day in September, the 4th of September, 2018, ICO sold off a total of 82,000 ETH. And the next day, not only did they have a whole lot less Ethereum in their pockets, but Ether's price crashed. Like it, yeah. it dropped down to, I think it was something like 220 bucks, something like that. And then we seen that the few days after that, it dropped below 200 bucks and kind of has been plummeting more and more since yeah interesting observation by trust nodes right yeah it's crazy this spike in in selling in fact in the past 30 days they found that roughly three hundred thousand ether has been sold by ico projects alone as in like the funds that they raised in their ico 300,000 Ether has been sold in the past 30 days. That is crazy. Yeah, we were talking right at the start about just like, it, it's tough to truly know what has triggered some of this sell-off, but I know you're about to share some stats on some of the, the projects that have sold the most, but there seems to be like a ripple effect where one project sells a ton of their ETH and then another project sees that and has like a knee-jerk reaction. It's like, oh no, this could really impact the price of ETH ether because these projects hold so much ether selling off this much will actually have a huge impact on the ether price so then the other projects are like okay well we better sell off some of ours before ether's price dips and then more projects do yeah. it and ether's price dips further it, it's just like a crazy terrible approach to managing the funds of projects that you're trying to build it just baffles me yeah it, it seems we're, we're speculating that in the same way, a lot of mismanagement in general has happened with ICOs recently. This is just an extension of that to poor fund management. I think it's, it's very likely that for many project leaders, this could be their first time managing a large amount of funds. And when you combine that with the volatility of those funds, 
you can have scare cells, uh, you know, <laughs> because uh, one day you could be putting out a press release talking about how you raised a hundred million dollars, and then the next day, with no action on your part, that hundred million could turn into fifty million, and right. that can cause scare cells. Yeah, and that's that's clearly what's happening as you look through some of the projects that have sold off huge amounts. Not only is like the price of ETH dropping, but the price of their native tokens dropping, their market caps dropping, which also then means like as a result, everyone that's investing in them, their portfolio is crashing at the same time. It, it's just like a cycle of abuse in in this like relationship in the in the blockchain space. I mean, we, there's a there's a really cool spreadsheet that we'll share out that literally lists in the past thirty days each ICO project and how much they sold out, and this is based on from like the middle of September 2018. So looking back at the past 30 days, the number one project sold the most of their ETH holdings was Digixdao. And Digix sold just under 70,000 Ether, which is a huge amount of their <laughs> overall amount that they, they have for their project. And as a result, I think their, their market cap value off the back of all of this like knock-on effect that happened I think it nearly halved in the space of like a day. It, it's just, it, it's crazy. Then following on from that, there's, I actually haven't heard of these two. I heard of Digix, but I hadn't heard of Decent Bet and Go Network. But mm -hmm. Decent Bet sold uh, the second most with 28,000 ETH and Go Network sold the third most with 17,000 ETH in just, just 30 days alone. That's yeah, a pretty that pretty significant amount, right? Yeah. Despite all of this, though, a lot of ICO investors are actually still in the green when it mm. comes to return on investment, especially the projects that ICO'd before the boom in 2017 when ETH was still well below even that $200 price mark that it's been floating around at. Yeah, you can check out like live pricing on thecoinoffering.com. You can look at icostats.com. There's coinmarketcap.com, a bunch of different sites. It seems like those projects that have ICO'd before, in particular, before 2017, but those that are in like the 2015, 2016 mark, uh, some of the early projects, I mean, Ethereum being one of the big ones, I think Ethereum is still, even with its current price, up something crazy like 20,000%, right? In terms of ROI yeah. on the, the initial price. And a lot of those earlier projects are there. But that there, there, there is, with a lot of the newer projects that are coming out now, especially those that happened right in the period of time, kind of late 2017 there there are a significant amount of those ico projects well in the red yeah but it doesn't seem to be slowing down the amount of icos coming out austin right yeah so even though we talk about the ico boom being in 2017 there has actually been a lot more money raised in icos in 2018 so that train is still rolling uh, and it's picking up speed. <laughs> so there, there were a total of 50 ICOs in 2016, and then huge spike to 371 ICOs in 2017. And then going far beyond that, there has actually been 784 ICOs in 2018 so far. And last time I checked, it's September right now. So we're only nine <laughs> months into this ride. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. And when you actually look at how much money has been raised in those ICOs, right? Like in 2017, you mentioned there was a total of 371 ICOs. Now, all of those combined, they raised a US dollar equivalent amount of 6.2 billion USD. So far, up to from January to September 2018, 20 billion has been raised in USD. That's that's insane. I mean, EOS, they, they finished their, I think it was like a year long ICO that they did that finished near the start of 2018. One project raised 4 billion US dollars. Unbelievable. <laughs> 4 billion US dollars. When they hold that much kind of cryptocurrency, if they do a mass sellout of 
I, I think they raised in ETH. I can't remember off the top of my head now. But like in their ICO, like if they sell off a large proportion of their tokens, like that has a huge ripple effect on the entire market. So there's a significant amount of like power being built up by companies in, in that space as well. Yeah. We've seen with some like private ICOs, like I remember us talking way back in series one, right? About the Telegram ICO that kind of happened, kind of didn't happen. They raised, I think, 1.7 billion in just a private ICO sale. Then they were going to do a public sale and they were like, uh, no, we've kind of got enough money now uh, with our <laughs> 1.7 billion. Uh, we still haven't seen really what they're going to do with that yet. But I think what this does is, right, like the appetite from consumers and investors, those now being almost one in the same with ICOs, hasn't really slowed down. Yeah. Which is, it's kind of crazy when you realize how many of these projects die relatively quickly, yeah. right? Exactly. And I think that this, this does tie back a bit to some of the shady stuff that, that has been happening with ICOs plus the overall volatility of the market. But the Boston College Carroll School of Management recently released a study on over 4,000 ICOs, and they found that the majority of projects were considered dead within four months of <laughs> issuing their token to buyers. Four months. <laughs> like, that is, that is just, that's insane. Uh, that can you imagine like starting a company and closing doors within four months that like, like after raising like millions upon millions? Yeah. Yeah. It's just insane. It's just crazy. Right. And I think that's the, that's the challenge here because even when this happens, a lot of people that are still intelligent people are making a lot of money, usually at the expense of of people who are not necessarily as clued up as to how some of this space works. We've seen a lot with people doing like pump and dump schemes and that's ultimately when people will buy up a ton of tokens from an ICO uh, that's been launched from a project. They will wait until it gets listed on a big, big exchange. The price increases, they sell off everything they have. They make a huge return almost immediately all of their tokens cause a landslide in the price and everyone else sees huge losses. And yeah. it's just like something that happens so much. One of my favorite websites to go on is deadcoins.com. And uh, it's actually like a graveyard of crypto projects, right? So it's a website that lists every single crypto project that has just died. <laughs> and there are now over 900 projects listed on deadcoins.com. Like it, that, for me, shows when we consider that a large majority of those have either started in 2017 or 2018 and they're yeah. dead already. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't fill me with confidence. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And, and actually, a study was published on Bitcoinist that stated that over 20% of all ICOs were, in fact, scams. I think that's conservative, uh, yeah. considering the number of dead projects and the amount of people that have, have gotten burned just for holding on to their coins for a couple months because these projects are dying so quickly. Yeah, and if you look at, like, we were talking, right, so what, 50 ICOs in 2016, 371 ICOs in 2017, 784 ICOs in 2018. That's under 2,000 ICOs. Now, not every project that launches has an ICO, but nowadays, like, pretty much that is the case. If 900 projects, crypto projects, are dead, that's a significant portion of that, like, number of ICOs that are in that bucket. That 900 does yeah. include non-ICO raising ones, but it, it is an alarming stat. And I, I do think to kind of like bring this back a little bit while we while we close this out, I don't think what we're saying is that ICOs are fundamentally a bad thing. I think that the, there are a lot of projects that are trying to use an initial coin offering as a way of facilitating both 
raising capital, but also arming their community with a stake in their project yeah. that can be used. We just haven't seen so far a huge amount of usage. Yes, it's early days. I think there are good projects out there. If you are considering investing in an ICO, I mean, myself and Austin, we're not financial advisors, but what we can tell you is the things you should be looking out for. I would highly recommend you check out our episode on ICOs back in series one. But I think the key thing for me is like, for a lot of these projects, the the number one scam that seems to have showed up is them claiming that they have all these advisors with all this experience. They have this team behind them that's like graduates and PhDs from Harvard and MIT (laughs) and they're on the board of these companies. And a lot of it has been, in the scams this is, has been lies. For a lot of these projects, you can just reach out to these people on LinkedIn. They'll come back to you. Get a good feel for it. Go and if they have a beta, go and try and use the platform like, and see what it's actually like. Don't just listen and take this as a, like, how can I just make some money really quickly? Because it's the quickest way you're going to yeah. get burned, right? Yep, absolutely. And I think on that note, we'll close this off. I'm interested to see how ICOs develop. We'll share out a bunch of these different reports and studies that we mentioned, as well as that giant Reddit thread on the $1 billion Bitcoin. Yeah. And we will hopefully find out if Austin is the, the man behind that wallet. <laughs> and, but if not, we hope you enjoy the episode and we will see you next Friday. Thanks for listening. If you love this episode and want to show your appreciation to myself and Matt, make sure you subscribe and leave us a review on the CastBox app or your favorite podcasting platform. We'd really appreciate that. And if you haven't already, you can download the free CastBox app where you'll find us as one of the CastBox original shows. You can also visit thecoinoffering.com to learn more about cryptocurrencies, get caught up on some news, see how your currency is performing, and you can follow us on Twitter at the coin offering. Finally, you can ask us any questions you have by emailing us at podcast at the coin offering.com. The Decrypting Crypto Podcast is a Castbox original show, and its contents should not be used and are not intended as investment advice. Please do your own due diligence before making any investment, cryptocurrency or otherwise.